So, ye weave August Falcha Hig er seminar Trunona in you. Good evening and thank you all for joining us. My name is uh, Alexander O'Hara. I'm the National Director for Catechetics. On the behalf of the Council for Catechetics of the Irish Episcopal Conference and Veritas, you're all most welcome to the seventh webinar in this series, Together Along the Way Conversations on Catholic Faith Formation in Contemporary Ireland. This webinar series organized on behalf of the Council for Catechetics and Veritas aims to bring together leading theologians, religious educators, and catechists to explore new avenues for Catholic faith formation in contemporary Ireland, inspired by the new directory for catechesis published by the Pontifical Council for Promoting New Evangelization in 2020. In the large, diverse, and complex religious education landscape, directories for catechesis function as atlases that guide educators and faith communities. However, we need leaders and visionaries who help us to interpret those atlases and read the maps they contain. In the run-up to the National Synod in Ireland, we hope that this webinar series will animate and inspire religious educators, teachers, cultural leaders, evangelizers, and anyone interested in sharing the best of the Catholic tradition with creativity and conviction. And just to know that this is a public forum and we will be recording this webinar. So I'm honored to welcome our seventh speaker in the series, Sister Carino Hodder. Sister Carino is a Dominican sister of St. Joseph based in Portsmouth Diocese in the UK. She's a first Holy Communion and Confirmation Catechist with particular interest in family-led catechesis and the catechesis of children with disabilities and additional needs. She also assists with the training of parish catechists through her community's apostolate for faith formation, light of truth. In this talk, Sister Carino discusses how the Directory for Catechesis proposes that salvation history should not only provide the content of catechetic instruction, but also inspire its method. Sister Carino will speak to us this evening on teaching as God teaches divine pedagogy in the Directory for Catechesis. So you're most welcome, Sister, and if you'd like to, to lead us in, in a prayer. So, yes, thank you very much, everybody. And to, to welcome God into this time, to show that we are open to his inspirations and his guidance as we go deeper into his plan for the ministry of catechesis he's given to his church, we can begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And pray together. Mary, Mother of the Church, on the morning of Pentecost, you presided with your prayer over the beginning of evangelization under the action of the Holy Spirit. Today, continue to intercede so that the people of the present time may encounter Christ and through faith in him be saved. Mary, most holy, continue to shine as an exemplar of catechesis and our model for the transmission of the faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that prayer I've taken from the final paragraph of the Directory for Catechesis, sort of changing the wording slightly to make it into, into a prayer, but I thought it was appropriate to begin with the words and the desires and the aims of the Directory for Catechesis as we discuss it's teaching together. I'd also like to point out that, um, as, as, as many of you know, um, apostolic sisters often, often work in twos, and so you'll notice that there is someone uh, very similarly dressed to me on this call, which is Sister Cooey Fowler, um, and sis, Sister, Sister Cooey is originally from the Diocese of Down and Connor, and she, did I, I, I got that right, didn't I, Sister Cooey? <laughs> and, uh, She's she's a she's an interesting one. I wanted to bring her on this Zoom because she sort of began her sort of adult professional life as a secondary school teacher in the north of Ireland and is now working in, well, in various different um, forums in the UK. 
but including in parish catechetics in the UK. So she's got a very interesting perspective of someone who used to be a school teacher and now has experience as, as a parish catechist. So I thought her experience would be useful in the, in the Q&A when we get to it. So just to give you a brief summary, first of all, of what I'm gonna be talking about this evening. My three main points are this. Firstly, that salvation history reveals to us God's teaching style, which the Catechism and Dave Verbum of the Second Vatican Council calls the divine pedagogy. And this is language that gets picked up in the Directory for Catechesis. Secondly, that the Directory for Catechesis tells us that salvation history, so the things that God has done for us, the way that God has acted in the world, is not just what we teach in catechesis, it's not just the what of catechesis, it's also the how of catechesis. It gives us the methodology of our catechesis. And specifically, and this is the bit where I sort of take what the directory says and kind of riff on it in a slightly more kind of personal way. So you don't see this said directly in the directory, but I think it is kind of implicit in what the directory says, that the divine pedagogy helps us to understand what the directory says about the role of a catechist. And we'll see that the directory says in paragraph 113, if you're following along at home, I have mine here, <laughs> um, that the catechist is a teacher of the faith, but also a witness to the faith and an accompanier in the faith. And the divine pedagogy helps us to understand how all three of these roles link together and are equally necessary. So if we could have the next slide, please, Alex. So we're going to begin with the word of God, because as the church tells us, as the Second Vatican Council, in fact, tells us in its constitution on divine revelation, the word of God, the sacred scriptures is the soul of theology. It's what makes theology alive and intelligible. So we always begin our theology and our catechesis with the word of God. I've got three passages from Exodus that I'm just going to read to you now. So we just take a moment to settle ourselves before we read the word of God. Firstly, from Exodus chapter three. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. From the book of Exodus, chapter 13. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. God says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. If we could have the next slide, please, Alex. In these three passages from Exodus, which present to us the defining event of salvation history before the coming of Christ, which is the exodus from Egypt. We find three very different ways in which God engages with humanity. First, we have God revealing who he is to, the, to Moses' intellect. Moses asks a question to understand who God is. And God feeds Moses' knowledge, his understanding, with knowledge and understanding of who he is. He says, I am who I am. But in the second passage, God isn't speaking. He's simply being with them. Exodus is very clear that on Israel's journey through the desert, God is always accompanying them. He's always with them. But then thirdly, we, we hear that not only does God tell Moses who he is, not only does he stay with the people of Israel, but also he gives them commandments. 
he gives them a way of life through which they can live in his love for them, which guide and structure and grow their love for God through a given way of life, which God leads them deeper and deeper into. And if we could have the next slide, Alex, I think if we were to sum up these three different ways that God is with his people, we can say that God teaches his people, which is what we see in the first passage, God tells Moses, he teaches him, I am who I am. He walks with them. We see that in the second passage where he is with them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. He is always walking with them. And thirdly, he integrates them into a way of life. He gives them commandments to live by so that their whole lives can be given over to following God and to being close to him. And these passages, if we could have the next slide, Alex, these passages map on very clearly to what the Catechism tells us about the divine pedagogy, God's teaching style. These are three very clear places in the scripture where we see what the Catechism says illustrated in a very concrete way. So firstly, we hear that and I'm reading here from paragraph 53 of the Catechism. The divine plan of red revelation involves a specific divine pedagogy. God communicates himself to man. We see that in Moses saying, I am who I am. We see that it's done gradually. We see that in the fact that God stays with the people every single day and night. He doesn't just give them his whole self in like 30 minutes. And thirdly, and here the catechism is, is picking up on the teaching of St. Irenaeus. God and man become accustomed to one another through living with each other. And this is the giving of the commandments that we see in Exodus 20. And if we could have the next slide, Alex, I think we can sum this up in saying that both the catechism and Exodus tell us that God teaches his people, he walks with them, and he integrates them into a way of life. That's what God does. That's how God speaks to us. And what's interesting now is we're gonna to turn to another passage from, if you like, the other end of the Bible, more towards the end. We're gonna have a passage now from the Acts of the Apostles in the time of the church after the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so again, we take a moment to settle ourselves before we read the word of God. Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? The eunuch replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Then Philip began to speak and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And that is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter eight. If we could have the next slide, Alex. So we remember that what we learned from Exodus was that God teaches, walks with, and integrates into a way of life. And if we have the next slide, please, Alex. What similarities are there between what God does in Exodus and what Philip is doing here? If we just take a moment to think about that, where do we see Philip teaching the people of God? Where do we see Philip accompanying, walking with the eunuch? Where do we see Philip integrating the eunuch into a new way of life? Can we have the next slide, please, Alex? You've probably worked out by now, I am a big, oh, no, sorry. One back. You've probably worked out. Oh, oh dear. 
Oh, back, back a few, please, Alex. There we go, excellent. Uh, you've probably worked out by now that I'm a big fan of color coding. Possibly Alex's computer is not, which is why it's trying to skip past my color coding, but I, I insist <laughs> we shall have color coded scriptures. Oh, sorry. Oh, if we could go back again, Alex, that'd be great. Marvelous. So what we see here is that Philip, remarkably like God, teaches the eunuch. He proclaims to him the good news about Jesus. He reveals Jesus, the son of God, to him. But he also walks with the eunuch. I mean, in this case, it's figurative. He sat in a chariot with him. But still, they journey together. He stays with the eunuch for an extended period of time. And thirdly, he integrates the eunuch into a way of life. He baptizes him. He gives him the sacrament that integrates, grafts the eunuch onto Christ's mystical body, gives him the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the whole Trinity, and all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He gives him a new way of life. And so if we could have the next slide, please, Alex. That passage from the Catechism that we saw maps on really well to what God does in Exodus we see it also maps on really well to what Philip is doing in the Acts of the Apostles. If we could have the next slide, please, Alex. The church teaches God's people, walks with them, and integrates them into a way of life. It's what God does, and now it's what the church does. Teaching, walking with, and integrating into a way of life. Now, why have I spent so long explaining all of this? If we could have the next slide, please, Alex. The reason I've gone into so much detail about that is because the directory for catechesis tells us that revelation is God's great educational work. And catechesis is meant to follow in the footsteps of the teaching style that God reveals to us through that great educational work. And this is something we see both in the previous directory, the general directory for catechesis, and also the current directory, the confusingly similarly named directory for catechesis. And I have to say, it's always a very interesting exercise to compare the previous directory, the GDC, with the current directory, with DC. And luckily, the GDC is online. Um, in a way that the current directory is, is sadly not. So it's, it's very easy to find the text of, of the previous directory. And it's very interesting to see how things develop and change over the course of the two directories. And one of the things that's very striking about the current directory is that the discussion of the divine pedagogy as the model for our pedagogy as catechists is a lot more well-developed. It's a lot better developed. Um, there are a lot more scriptural references. There's a lot more discussion of what the divine pedagogy is. So that's just an interesting development to see across the course of the two, um, the two directories. So the directory presents to us God's pedagogy as the model for our pedagogy, our teaching and communication style as catechists. Can we have the next slide, please, Alex? Now I'm going to start quoting from the directory now. So we've seen from the Acts of the Apostles that Philip, representing here the whole church and its ministry for catechesis, Philip teaches the eunuch, he walks with, as in accompanies, the eunuch, and he integrates the eunuch into a way of life. And this is a, an echo of the divine pedagogy. And what I like is that these three things that Philip does following what God does in Exodus, map very well onto what the directory tells us characterizes um, our following of the divine pedagogy. So the directory says that the way in which we as catechists follow the divine pedagogy is to firstly bring into focus the universal destination of salvation. 
So that means basically telling people about Jesus, making sure they know and understand that we are called to beatitude, that we are made in the image and likeness of God, remade by baptism in the image of his son and called to share in eternal happiness with him forever in heaven. Secondly, the, the directory says that we need to adopt the principle of the progressive nature of revelation. And I think anyone who has ever worked in school catechetics or parish catechetics know that you cannot know a child, you cannot know an adult, you cannot know a teenager in one day or even one term, or dare I say, even one catechetical program. To truly know people, you need to spend time with them and walk with them. And that is exactly what Philip does with the eunuch. And thirdly, valuing the community experience of the faith as proper to the people of God. And I think as practicing Catholics, we know that this refers to the sacramental life and participation in the liturgy above all the Holy Mass. Um, I don't know how common this is in an Irish context, because this is not the context I'm speaking from, but I know that in England, where I work as a catechist, every year you have a few children, or dare I say quite a few children, who come forward to receive the Eucharist for the first time. You've never seen them before in the parish. They're very, very keen for the six months that the programme lasts. And then a couple of weeks after they've received their first Holy Communion, you never see their families ever again in the church. And that was one of the experiences that made me stop, that really made me stop and think, am I catechizing as the directory asks me to catechize? Because part of our work is integrating people, the people of God, into the way of life, the liturgical way of life, the sacramental way of life, which it is their privilege to live as baptized people of God. And that's what we see in the Old Testament where God leads his people through into the life of the Ten Commandments is what we see in the New Testament when in the Acts of the Apostles, people are getting baptized left, right and center. You cannot read a chapter in Acts without at least a thousand people getting baptized. That's a slight exaggeration, but there's an awful lot of integrating people into the sacramental life of the church in the Acts of the Apostles. And I think we should we should take that as edifying as parish catechists. I was thinking about how the directory talks about salvation history and it occurred to me that it was a lot like a corkscrew and as someone who likes a good visual aid, here is a corkscrew for you. In the first part of the directory for catechesis, sort of mostly paragraphs 11 to 14, where the, where the directory is, is talking about divine revelation per se, in a way that's riffing very heavily on, on Dave Verbum and the Second Vatican Council. Salvation history is presented as what we teach. We tell people about what God has done. We, we tell the people we're catechizing about the Exodus, about the prophets, about the coming of Jesus, about his passion, death and resurrection. We tell people about that. We proclaim it to them in our catechesis. But then, the, the directory comes back to the subject of salvation history and it goes deeper as it does so. And so in paragraphs 157 to 166, it talks about salvation history as how we teach. This progressive revelation of who God is, where God walks with his people as he reveals himself to them and integrates them into a way of life. This is how we teach. So the directory returns to the subject of salvation history but in a deeper way. And of course, ultimately, the, the climax of salvation history is the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in the flesh for our salvation. And so as you'd expect, um, what the directory has to say about God's pedagogy as our pedagogy is ultimately very focused on what we know of God through his revelation in Jesus Christ. Now this is a very well-known passage from the Gospel of John. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us full of grace and truth. I think this really sums up who Jesus is. And what I love about this passage as well is it also sums up the divine pedagogy 
as it reaches its climax in Jesus. If we could have my next slide with, with even more color coding here. So the word dwells among us, just as God dwelt with his people during the Exodus when he traveled with them as the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. Jesus spends time with us. He spends 33 years with us and he's full of grace. What is grace? It's the shared divine life. He's integrating us into a way of life, the life of grace by being with us. He doesn't just tell us stuff. He gives us a way of life, which is his own life. And finally, he's full of truth. He reveals to our mind, to our intellect, who he is. That is who God is. So the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, full of grace and truth. And you see here is exactly what we've seen in the Acts of the Apostles and what we've seen in the book of Exodus. It's Jesus teaching, walking with, and integrating into a way of life. Just as the directory for catechesis says that we should. What Jesus does is the absolute climax and perfection of the divine pedagogy. And so Jesus isn't simply who we're, who we're teaching in our catechesis, he is the how we teach in catechesis. He's not just the who of catechesis, he is the how of catechesis. If we could have our next slide, Alex, I've got a few questions for you to ponder. Because, you know, the so much of God's divine plan of salvation comes down to his, his gracious will that we cannot fully understand. And God chose to become a human being and dwell among us, but he could have become a Zoom call and sent a registration link among us. He could have become a textbook to be read among us. The word could have become a presentation and been viewed among us. How would our faith, how would our salvation be different if God had not chosen to come to us as a person, but had chosen to come to us as disembodied facts, just as a message? If he hadn't chosen to come to us as a baby who loved his mother or a friend who wept when his friends experienced death and misfortune, if he hadn't chosen to come to us as someone who spat on the ground and rubbed dirt on the eyes of a man who needed healing or who stretched out his hands to heal the leper. What if he'd come to us just as facts? Our faith would be very different and our teaching style, our pedagogy would be very different because God, who gives us his own pedagogy as our pedagogy, has chosen to come to us as a human being who lives in relationship with other human beings. If I may be slightly polemical, if I could have the next slide, Alex. God sends us a person, not a PowerPoint. I've had... Um, I've had experiences of um, hearing about uh, uh, sort of, uh, not homilies, like pre preaching given in, in big evangelical churches where there's like an amazing PowerPoint going on. And I've heard people sort of making slightly sort of flippant comments like, I don't think Jesus gave us a PowerPoint on the Mount and things like that, which are kind of silly comments, but I think it it does point us to the deep truth that God has chosen to speak to us and to be with us in a personal relationship. And therefore, that's something we need to take into account when we catechize. Are we entering into a personal relationship of love with the people whom we catechize? Or are we happy just to stand in front of them and read from the textbook? Is that how God speaks to us? And I speak as someone for whom, especially when I first started catechizing, it was very tempting just, just to read out of the book or to say, well, I've planned a really good session. So I really hope none of them show that they're having a personal crisis, which suggests that I actually need to talk about something else about the faith that's more relevant to them right now. Or I hope none of the children ask a really good question that takes us off on a slight tangent because I've got my lesson written down here. Actually, we're, we're categorizing the people in front of us who desire a personal relationship with God. And that is often going to come through our catechesis. If I could have our next slide, Alex. 
This requires a bit of explaining, but I thought one way to, to sum up what the directory tells us is that God empowers catechists. So God doesn't empower some kind of vague abstract theory called catechesis. God empowers through baptismal grace, through the Great Commission that we read about in Matthew 28. He empowers individual baptized Christians to go forth and spread his word. He doesn't empower a particular method of teaching. He doesn't empower a, you know, a particular resource. He empowers people because he's revealed himself to us personally. And so he wants us to reveal others, sorry, to reveal him to others in that same personal way. So not just giving them facts about God, but also walking with them, integrating them into a way of life, making them welcome in the parish, making them welcome at mass, knowing what's going on in their lives, knowing the ways in which they struggle to open themselves to the love and mercy of God and where they need someone to walk alongside them. We could have the next slide, please, Alex. I'm now going to quote to you uh, my favourite paragraph from the Directory for Catechesis, which all the sisters are bored of hearing. Sister Sister Cooey is like just quietly glazing over in the background now because she's she's heard me quote this paragraph from, from the Directory so many times. But I think it's beautiful. It's such a rallying cry for all of us as catechists. The Directory says that by virtue of faith and baptismal anointing, in collaboration with the Magisterium of Christ, and as a servant of the Holy Spirit, the catechist is, drum roll, next slide please, thank, thank you Alex, um, a witness, a teacher, and an accompanier, an expert in the art of accompaniment. And this is, I think, what we very clearly see in God's pedagogy. The word dwelt among us, he accompanies us through our human lives. He's full of grace. He leads us into a way of life, which is what we do when we witness to people, when we witness our faith. He's full of truth. And it's that same truth that we transmit to others when we catechize. And so there are these three equally important roles that we take on when we take on the privilege of, of being a catechist. We witness to a way of life. We teach the truth of Christ and we accompany those who want to get to know Christ better. And the reason we know that we're called to do this is because Jesus Christ himself did this and it's his pedagogy that we're following. If we could have the next slide, Alex, I've brought back my corkscrew because the directory does a very similar thing with Jesus Christ himself as it does with, the, with salvation history. So in the first bit of the directory, the first section, he, it talks about Jesus Christ as who we teach. We have to teach people who Jesus Christ is in our catechesis. But also, when we go back to the subject of Jesus towards the end of the directory, sorry, that implies that he's not mentioned in the middle. I mean, he is, he's mentioned all the way through. But when we, when we return to Jesus in paragraphs 160 to 161, he's presented as how we teach. His way of teaching is how we teach. And of course, one of the ways he teaches is by not just teaching. He doesn't just teach. He integrates into a way of life, his divine way of life, and he accompanies people along their journey. And so the directory, once the directory establishes who Jesus is, it makes sure that we know that Jesus is also how we are called to catechize. So if we go to our next slide, Alex, just to finish off, I have a thought experiment for you. Oh, sorry, I've missed out a slide. Yeah, firstly, here we go. So summing up in much more beautiful and authoritative words what I've just said, the directory tells us that as catechists, we are participating in Jesus's mission by introducing others into his relationship with the Father. So what Jesus did during his earthly life, we are now doing as catechists. We're witnessing to a way of life, we're teaching the truth of God, and we're accompanying others on their personal journey towards God. 
So now, a little thought experiment for you about applying the divine pedagogy. Here is, here is the first Holy Communion program at the parish church of St. Imaginarius. Um, and this is very much based on, on the kind of the English model of catechesis where it's not done in schools. So you go to your parish and apply to receive um, preparation for First Holy Communion. Um, so yes, bear in mind that this, this is based on, on another country's model, but I understand that in Ireland you are moving towards parish-based catechesis. Um, so this is the nightmare future that might await you um, if you're not careful. Uh, so in the parish church of St. Imaginarius, families put in an application form before the deadline, of course, um, the application form asks for the age of the child and for evidence that they've been baptised. And we meet for a, for a few sessions, maybe four to six. And in those sessions, we show the children where to sit and stand during the first Holy Communion Mass, because there's no assumption that they, they've been to Mass before. Um, who's going to do the readings at Mass and also who's going to bring up the gifts of the offertory. And again, there's no expectation that this family is known to anybody in the parish. Um, no expectation that anybody knows their background, their kind of personal beliefs, um, is friends with them in any way or that they've ever been part of the parish community. They just need to live geographically within the parish. Based on what we know that the directory presents to us as the model for catechesis, Catechesis as a process of witnessing, accompanying, and teaching the truth of Christ. How would you change this program in light of the divine pedagogy? And I may, you may think that I've given you a very extreme example, and that was that was a pretty extreme example. The parish of Saint Imaginarius, as you've probably worked out, doesn't exist. But the thing is, elements of the formation program at the parish of Saint Imaginarius exist in the vast majority of parish catechetical programs in the diocese dioceses um, where I have lived and worked. There is a great focus on simply teaching the mechanics of the First Holy Communion Mass. There is not much of an attempt to witness and to integrate into a way of life, to get to know the families as valued friends of the parish community as fully integrated members of the parish community. There's not a great emphasis on teaching the truth of who Christ is and how he is present to us in the Eucharist. So you may be in a position where you're presented with, with a program of formation that's very similar to the one at St. Imaginarius. And it's worth remembering that the directory calls us to this beautiful vision of catechesis, which is based on the very pedagogy of God himself. God's own teaching style of revealing the truth about himself, of integrating us into a way of life out of love and of walking with us personally is our model for catechesis. We're called to be personal, loving, accompaniers, witnesses, as well as teachers to the people of God who we meet in our schools and parishes. So if we could have our next slide, Alex, I'm just gonna, cause I'm a big fan of like reiterating my main points at the end, just in case anyone thinks, oh, wow, I have no recollection of, of her saying that, or wow, she, she really messed up trying to make that point. So I need to ask her to clarify that, etc. So, what we've looked at this evening is how salvation history reveals to us God's teaching style, fancy term for which is the divine pedagogy. We've seen that the directory for catechesis presents salvation history, not just as the what of what we do, but also the how of what we do. And thirdly, I suggested that paragraph 113 of the directory, which is where we learn that a catechist is a witness and a company and a teacher, is an excellent demonstration of that divine pedagogy. We teach the truth of the faith, but we also witness to the joy of our faith in our liturgical and sacramental life. And we accompany in a personal and loving way in faith. 
so I'd like to just finish um, with a prayer for on our next slide, just giving glory to God for our time together this evening and what he has revealed to us for his plan for the ministry of catechesis for his church. And so we give glory to the Father by saying, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Carino, for that inspiring um, presentation. Um, and it's particularly exciting now when um, the National Co Episcopal Conferences are preparing documents on, on the new lay ministry of, of mm -hmm. catechist um, that Pope Francis has, has instituted. So thank you so much for that rich um, uh, presentation. We have some time now just to open it um, for discussion, um, uh, if you'd like to um, uh, discuss, just please uh, unmute and um, uh, maybe raise your raise your hand. Thank you. Excellent. Yes, very happy for questions. Everyone seems fairly chilled out. Oh, yeah. Bernadette's yeah. got a hand up. Hello. This is going to be um, for some people quite a revelation. Um, and a complete change of how they've been thinking about catechesis. Mm. Um, we've always said, if you're, you know, grab a teacher and they'll do it. Yeah. Um, but a teacher always has a lesson plan. And we know ourselves that God's lesson plan isn't quite what we have in, plan, have in mind sometimes. So I, what I'm saying is this is going to take some time for catechists or people who have been catechists and are catechists and people who are coming forward to actually take this on board mm. um, before we see any changes and then any consequently any fruit from what yeah. we're doing. Yeah. So how, what I'm asking is how, how are we going to get this out there mm. and how, or how are we going to get away from the parish of saint imaginarius <laughs> how are we really going to yeah. drive this forward yes you know? yeah challenge yeah and um i think both you and i Bernard, have had experiences of, of sitting down with a parish priest and saying i don't think this is working and being asked well show me a parish that's doing something else is there any precedent for what you're suggesting um and Bernadette and I are actually part of a, a very nascent group of um, catechists who meet on a semi-regular basis to talk about uh, what we call family-focused catechesis. So, so catechesis that's focused on getting to know a whole family, making sure the family feel welcome in the parish and that the family is encouraged to, to feel confident practicing their faith at home. Um, so in future, I would really like to be able to say to people, Look, if you want to speak to our little network of catechists who are trying to put this teaching of the church into practice, you know, come along and chat to us because actually there is a bit of a formal network. You don't have to feel lonely and isolated um, in applying this teaching of the directory in your parish. Um, the second thing I would point out is I think for a lot of catechists, the idea of moving to something that is less um program based and that looks a lot less like a school um, model seems terrifying because it seems like more work on the face of it it seems like more work and to those catechists I would just like to ask you know and to those teachers who who teach sacramental preparation in a school setting for those of you in Ireland how do you feel after you've put in nine months of work into giving input to children, arguing with parents. I'm assuming that you have a few arguments with parents every so often. I, you know, I certainly do. Um, putting in all that work, that feeling of despair when you have several children who do not know the basics of their faith or want to practice it, 
And then that feeling of impending burnout, when you realize that after all that work you've done, none of them are coming back to receive Christ in the Eucharist for much longer after they've made their first Sunday communion or practicing their faith after they've received the sacrament of confirmation. How does that make you feel? Does that feel like a small amount of work or a lot of work? <laughs> because actually the, the model we've ended up with, which is meant to be easy of, we deliver the contents, they absorb it, and then they're ready for the sacraments. That's actually a huge amount of work for very little fruit. And certainly in an English context, it is sadly normal to speak to catechists who say, yeah, n none of my first Holy Communion class come back after the first Holy Communion Mass. Or, yeah, after confirmation, none of none of the teenagers come back to, to Mass unless they're, like, preternaturally, you know, pious. That's a lot of work mm. for very little, very little obvious fruit. And I know, I know we're people of faith and people of hope, so, you know, we, we, we have faith and we hope that we've planted seeds but but nevertheless, we we also need to be blunt and honest about the fact that often in the short term, this seems to be counterproductive. And so I think it's a case of presenting people with the fact that actually putting in place a model that seems like more work actually leads to a more organic and fruitful and spirit led result because you have families who are more likely to keep practicing the faith after they've um after they've exited the sacramental conveyor belt and paula's got a hand up alex is it okay to yes yeah paula hi i won't be too long um i was just thinking at our church um what our what what we've actually put in place is the fact that that we run a children's alpha course oh wow and, and also an adults one Mm. And children aren't put um, through to their Holy Communion or anything like that until both the children have done the whole course and so the so do the adults. Yeah. So, uh, but, I mean, obviously, I don't, I didn't really understand a lot of tonight. I'd have to, be, as you know, I'm autistic and I go by like a lot of visual stuff. So I want to learn about it, and I have been saying that I want to actually do more. Oh, but yeah. it, this is why I'm coming on these courses so I can understand a bit more. But yeah, yeah. obviously, with all the information, I was getting lost, but I okay. took little bits from it. But yeah, so I thought I'd share that. that obviously, we we're into we've introduced the alpha because we've had a problem for so long that parents will come along, and it's to, it's the same with when they get married. Obviously, when they want to baptize their ch child. They come and get father to sign the staff because they come once or something. Yeah. And as you say, sister, once they've been baptized, you never see them again. Yeah. And they do it. They do it to actually get into the school. They want to get their child into the school. So obviously, so now that that's the requirements at our church. I know. I know that for a fact. Right. Yeah. So they do. That they have to do the whole course. So they've got an understanding of yeah. like you know of, of of like our faith yeah which i yeah. think is an absolutely fantastic idea because the as you know the alpha course isn't just a, just a couple of sessions is it it's actually no, six or seven yeah that's what i wanted to say anyway that's brilliant yeah and Thank um you, also paula like if you want to um because you've got my email address so if you want to have a chat afterwards about anything you didn't you didn't quite get or could could do with having shown visually just just let me know um but i think what Paul has just explained about having some kind of process for initial proclamation. Push it. Sorry. I think having some kind of process for initial proclamation, both for um, the parents and for the children, is is a is a really good idea, because otherwise you're trying to do like a massive mopping up exercise in catechesis, and it's no longer catechesis because catechesis is, is the deepening of a pre-existing faith. Whereas actually, if 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 children and families need their faith igniting in the first place, let's do that first. And also I think um, what um, Paula said about making sure to form the parents, I think more and more people are realizing that that's really crucial because 
is, is one of those teachings of the church that, that plays out really, really obviously in reality. You know, you don't need a huge amount of faith <laughs> to believe this teaching of the church, that the, the parents are the primary catechists of their children. That what happens at home and what the children see mummy and daddy doing at mass and how they see mummy and daddy praying has a huge effect on a child's faith. And um, Alex, if, if you want if you want more ideas of sort of people to talk to about about catechesis, we've got um, I know a few catechists who have been who have done a lot of quite sort of innovative work in coming up with ways to to catechize families so Wonderful. that yeah it's it's not it's not just the child in school who yeah. receives like a blast of information yeah it's yeah, no. it's actually a whole it's a whole family process so that's no, it, is, it, is, yeah. it is crucial crucial yeah. yeah no thank you thank you paula we have one more from mary ochi yes oh, brilliant. oh hello oh hi mary you're right there mary i don't think we can hear you no mary oh i think i think she might be having connection issues i'll, I'll um I had one question just it's come up here in Ireland um, as when we've been working on the national norms and guidelines for the ministry of the catechist and we've had a working group around that but a few people have said there's been kind of some confusion about exactly what the catechist is and I think you've clarified a lot today and and, and the directory is very clear about that mm -hmm. but a few people have said well what's the difference between a parish pastoral worker and a catechist um, what's distinctive about them that's that's a very good question and I suppose it would it would differ from parish to parish depending on what the exact role of, of the pastoral worker is but I would say that a catechist um, has a distinct role in guiding people towards the sacraments and ensuring that they have the necessary dispositions to to receive the sacraments I think that's possibly one of the things that sets um, a catechist apart from a from a pastoral worker. And also, I think the the explicit proclamation of, of the faith in a way that speaks to to the intellect is also part of catechesis, because although we need to get this balance of, you know, teacher, witness and accompanier, um, like rebalancing things more towards witness and accompanier shouldn't shouldn't um cancel out the fact that we still do need the the explicit transmission of of the truth of the faith um whether that's through like sacramental prep sessions or through like ongoing talks and workshops that that go on in the parish so i would say the the emphasis on guiding towards the sacraments and also the the explicit proclamation of the faith is what sets apart from a pastoral worker thank you thank you sister so we'll just take two more um, interventions. Uh, Sister Kui. I won't actually ask any questions. I have lots of thoughts on Ireland and the direction they need to go in, having just left. But it was just to mention, Alex, that we do have an essential training for catechists course coming up in January. That might be of interest to the people. Perhaps you're asking for that definition of what's the difference. And whatever. it's six weeks of really taking you through the role of a catechist and what a catechist should do and things like that you know so it's a it's a course that may be interesting interesting for some members that maybe are asking you that it's essential training for catechists starting in january wonderful wonderful and is this is this the one in limerick sister no 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 that's actually a lovely um program for young people that parishes may wish to do to accompany in the faith and mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful program but this is actually specifically for adults who okay. are either catechists or want to be catechists. It may even be, we get a lot of priests attend and it's a, it really is, um, it takes you through everything. Well, not everything, but takes you through all the essentials of the role of a catechist um, okay. and how to really, it really builds in the formation for catechists. Um, Sister Karina yeah. can fill you in on all the wonderful details right. and send you all the links and the emails. Um, but it's a six week really, beautiful course um, for anyone who's interested in catechesis or who um, is hoping to maybe get involved in it. And will that be online? Yes, on Zoom. And it's it's um, for six consecutive, one, or one, one session a week for six weeks. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, if I get those details, I can I can yeah. uh, circulate them. Thank we'll you. We'll send Thank them you. on to you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and for uh, Fernanda. Hi, hi. Thanks, Alex. And hello, sisters. Hello, uh, it was, hello it's Linda. a pleasure to see you. And thank you very much for a really, really good, concise, and really um, informative, but also formative uh, session. Oh, praise uh, God. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think w one of the things, and I think perhaps in Ireland, with the um, with the nature that catechesis has been organised in in Ireland over the years, there is an extra layer of discussion and kind of soul searching that needs to be done because obviously most of the catechesis is done in schools as far as I understand. Um, so it's very much something that is done as part of the curriculum and, and that in itself points towards a direction that uh, catechesis is something that it's informative, it's like gaining information and reading books and, and uh, filling in uh, worksheets. Um, which is very much the idea that we have in school. Uh, in England, we are blessed in a sense that from some time now, uh, catechesis has moved on to parishes. Um, and now it seems that it's going in a circle that is, is going back towards the home uh, mm. part. Uh, but uh, what I would like to, to ask is how, how to work this balance or the tension, that then there is a tension between contents and, and witnessing. Mm. And I think sometimes in the place that we are in, in England now, mm. and maybe it's a place that Ireland's gonna to come to it as well eventually, but mm. uh, it's a place that, you know, so you have the welcoming people on one side, wanting to make the parish really welcoming and vibrant. And, mm. you know, we've got, I don't know, uh, baby changing facilities and toys or whatever, um, but, uh, and staying at that for a long period of time. And then by the time, you want to move on to the to the teaching part the, the people already gone mm. <laughs> because they moved on to something else um and the other side is uh, no 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 we need to provide more content we need to teach the faith we need to teach yeah. you know salvation history and whatever so how to tease out these questions i like what paula put about the um the alpha uh that's being promoted sorry that was my phone going off um the alpha that's been organized in the parish and i think things like that are kind of crucial but i wonder sister if you've got not not you know a magic bullet or anything like that <laughs> but some suggestions that could help us to tease out this tension yeah my first thought when you were speaking was that um i think this is this is def definitely a a real issue in many parishes the kind of the tension between um sort of welcome without content and like the the cold transmission <laughs> of, of as many truths of the faith as possible in a short space of time um in my experience and this is something that i was thinking about for for quite a while when i started in parish catechette six is that i think that the three roles of the catechist witness accompanier and teacher um sort of build on each other and the foundational one is is the accompanier because what I found is that I can teach someone till the cows come home they will be asking me questions and like emailing me in the middle of the night what do you think of this do you what, what kind of resource can I look up for this I've just read this in the catechism and like buttonholing me after mass to ask me questions if I am already in a relationship with them mm. so if I'm already friends with them then I can they they are just they are just sponges they know they can come to me and be taught and it's maybe not in a systematic way but they also like when we put on a talk in the parish they will come to that but the individual people in the parish doing the teaching need to be trusted first um so one one way to 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 phrase it to the people who are very focused on the teaching is that your your message will not be received unless the people there trust you as a mm. as a friend the other, then on the flip side, with the people who are saying, but we need to have a bigger focus on welcome. Um, I'm sure we've all had the experience of looking out at a parish mass and looking at all the lovely families who you managed to invite through your excellent little message in the school, in the primary school newsletter, 
and your very well designed poster and the promise mm. of tea and biscuits after mass. Looking out at them and realizing that mum and dad look terrified because they have no idea what is happening at the mass. Mm. And if people do not understand why they are at mass, their their fidelity to the parish is not going to last very long. And so find it, finding ways to, to drip feed that teaching into their experience of coming to the parish, like, why do we come to mass? It's yeah. true that we come because the music is great and because I've been invited by my friend and because mm -hmm. my children love the children's liturgy and I my my friend bakes a cake after the mass and we have a chat together mm -hmm. these are all reasons why i come but also why do i do the things that i do at mass like why why do we sing this why does the bell ring at this point what's the big deal about holy communion yeah and and it was training would be good sister for people because i've just yeah. done that and and a nice tra training yeah. Sorry, Spartan, but i thought if that lady didn't know i've just done it completed that yeah. And obviously, obviously, we, we covered about people like because they do get frightened, don't they? And like that, you can't you don't want to be pushing them away. So yeah. it's all about listening and finding a common ground. I think I've got that right. Anyway, I'm remembering yeah. it fresh. Yeah, yeah. Anna, Anna, that's all right. Anna, Anna Nair's training that um, Catherine McCoolidge um, came up with is, is a very is a very good result. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I've just thought of, Nanda, is that um, the, the parish priest I work for, whom we both know, um, he does a thing he calls a, a catechesis mass, um, sort of riffing on the fact that the catechism says that, um, you know, the, 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 the mass is, is a preeminent place of catechesis. He does a catechesis mass where it's specifically for families and it, it, is, it is a mass, but every so often he pauses and says, this is why I'm doing this. And does anyone have any questions? And it lasts about an hour and a half. And it's a bit of a slog for him because all the children have loads of questions. But that for him, that's a really good example of integrating the kind of teaching that gives people more fidelity to the practice of their faith and also making sure that they they feel welcome and valued at, at the same time. So that's an example of a kind of initiative where where everybody wins, basically. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, fr Fernanda. Um, Mary, did you want to come in there? Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure what happened. Um, I do apologize. Um, sure. No, um, it, it's the separation of teenagers from the church. Oh, yeah. um, it, it is painful um, mm -hmm. for parents and for community. Um, what I have noticed, uh, I lived in Croatia for a long, long time. Um, it is a village and people are a lot more religious than people in the UK, I would say. Um, but they do have a community of teenagers who go to church together, uh, who gather together afterwards, they, they go out together. They're all Catholics, they're all based in the church. Now, we don't have that in the UK, um, yeah. well, at, at least around me. And when the teenagers start saying, well, I don't want to go to mass anymore. And it, it's, I hear that it's, it's a lot to do with what, what you do at home. But even if your parents actually go to church every Sunday, um, even if the parents are kind of kiss themselves, um, even if the parents are trying to, you know, parents are trying to sort of teach, not just teach, but, but show the way of worship and relating to Christ and God. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, if, if you, even if the child goes to Catholic schools, yeah. um, children go away, some children do go away. And yeah. it is a great suffering for many, many families. And, and and we get nothing from the church in the sense that you get lots of things for children's um, uh, liturgy. You, yeah. you get lots of things for like uh, first communion. And yeah. after first communion, you kind of like buy on your own. You know, mm -hmm. parents, you do it yourself. Parents don't know how to do it quite often. And quite often children don't listen to the parents. It's easier for children to listen to other teenagers. Yeah. And we yeah. don't have that um, yeah. like mind, well, we don't have that community of teenagers. Now, I yeah. went into Mormon church because only because I was very curious how they keep the young people. Yeah, fair now, enough. now, I do not, of course, I don't agree with the theology, but what they do is every Sunday, they actually, uh, before their service, they uh, have the age um, divided lessons or uh, theolo their theology lessons. 
So even in adults, they have like beginner moment, which I was put into, although I, anyway, um, and uh, expert moments. So they've got a class and, and from the young age, they're taught that, mm. you know, they're, they're really what, they, what they're going to, what they're aiming at uh, when they're 18 is to go on a mission. Mm. And that's what, what you, you see that. Now, yeah. whether I disagree agree or disagree, they manage to keep the younger people within the community. Mm. Um, and but we don't have that in the Catholic Church around me. Yeah. We would like that because it's 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 painful. It yeah. really. Yeah. I don't know how to. I don't. I at the moment I don't know how to do it. Um. Um. You know, it's it's, it's difficult. Mm. I think the two the two things that spring to mind when you're talking is firstly the fact that insofar as any research has been done into this. Um, and there hasn't been a huge amount of research done, but insofar as it has been done, people have found that statistically what keeps teenagers practicing their faith through their teenage years and into young adulthood is having um, peer group witnesses. So having kind of mentors who are the same age as them or just a bit older. Um, and I know that there's a catechist in Nanda's diocese, if I remember correctly, who's just finished her doctorate on this, I believe. Um, I'm afraid I cannot remember her name in the slightest, but um, someone's recently finished a doctorate on what keeps teenagers in the Catholic Church. And basically it's having um, witnessing a witnessing peer group. And it also reminds me of, um, I don't know if you have um, much of a presence of the neocatechumenical way in Ireland, but in this country, the neocats are quite well known for having um, good thriving hubs of ongoing fellowship and formation for teenagers. I remember um, a catechist uh, who I'm friends with saying that she was having a bit of a problem in, in her work parish because there was a big neocat presence and all the teenagers were like five million years ahead of all the other children in the confirmation class. And she was like, I don't know what to do with them. I can't just put them in a class with the others because they'll be bored out of their minds. <laughs> um, because because they, they met regularly in a little kind of small group hub and that kept their faith going. I think, and oh, actually, and as I was speaking, I just remembered another parish I know um, has a very good post-confirmation programme. Um, it is St. Elizabeth of Portugal in Richmond in Southwark Diocese in the UK. Um, Georgia Clark there has um, a very thorough post-confirmation, like, friendship and fellowship program and actually the next the next meeting of our sort of uh, family focused catechesis collaborative George is going to be talking about what she does for teenagers post confirmation to keep them in that that friendship and fellowship group and she uses a program called the ascent which I'm not sure if you have in Ireland but I will send you details Alex it's it's um it's a three-year program of ongoing discipleship for teenagers and often like as a religious when I meet young women who are really on fire for their faith um quite often they say to me oh it was when I was doing the ascent that I really like my faith really took off because I was I was with other young people who love their faith and that really helped and inspired me um so although I've never been part of the ascent or run it myself I, I know that it has helped a lot of very spiritually mature young teenage or 20 something Catholics. Um, so that's another thing I'd, I'd recommend to keep teenagers in the loop. And even so, Sister Karina, we've heard from the Ascent program that some people, some teenagers were sort of told by parents to go and do it. And oh. then when they were starting to maybe not really want to go, uh, when they did the program, it just totally transformed everything and now they're on fire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to interject that I think uh, the research that you mentioned, sister, it might have been Karen North who works yes, for Suburb. That, yes. She, that was her thesis, actually, that she found uh, Karen is my supervisor as well. Uh, okay. So I, I was really interested in in her, her thesis because what she wanted to investigate, she, said, she, she thought, oh, we have a problem with uh, disengagement, people leaving the face and everything. Mm. Um, and that's probably uh, relevant to this forum. Mm. And but she wanted to find out why some actually stay, what yeah. makes them stay. 
Uh, so she was really intrigued by that. And it, and it was very hopeful to read what she wrote. So, so yeah. one thing is, is the family background. That was the first thing. There was like a, a, a really huge proportion of over 90% of the, the, the young adults that she talked to. Uh, they come from from practicing families, but not practicing just something in the boxes kind of family. Oh, yeah, families that are actually discussing faith. They taking faith to the home. Uh, but what helped them is once they begin to expand the horizons to have communities like Youth Two Thousand, which mm. Youth Two Thousand I think it is in Ireland. Mm. I'm not sure the ascent is, um, or the ascent. You know, places like that where they could find peers their own age people that could support and could keep the faith a little bit tight so they wouldn't like spread out like hot coals that soon go cold when, yeah. when it is engaged sister corinne might have a bit of experience on that as well but that's perhaps is for a different different uh, uh zoom call <laughs> from your own experience of you know experiencing uh coming to faith and, and all oh, that. it's so true that's your yeah. story, it's true yeah yeah Thank you, uh, th thank you, Mary, and thank you, Fernanda. Uh, I know um, I, I recently came back from a youth symposium in Krakow on Christus Ooh. Vivus in, in Europe, and that was very hopeful as well. There was about 160 young people from all over Europe, and uh, they spoke about their own faith experience and what really helped them. I think a lot of it was having an accompanier, you, you, uh, someone who's willing to spend time with them to engage with them intellectually um that kind of presence um and to answer the questions yeah and also to give them co-responsibility in terms of their own initiatives but they're really looking for guidance and, and, and mentoring but i found it a very um hopeful experience and um recommend reading christus vivas um uh, as well for for youth uh, youth uh, ministry so it's, it's coming up to a quarter past days um just to thank uh sister carino again for a wonderfully rich uh presentation thank you all for joining us this evening thank um, you for having me just to say that our final web oh pleasure pleasure sister um that our final webinar in the series is going to be on the 7th of december it's a wednesday same time uh seven o'clock uh, with Father Jan Novotnik uh, from, from London, uh, who's a secretary for uh, discipleship and evangelization for the uh, bishops of England and, and Wales. That's going to be our eighth and final webinar. Uh, and just to say that um, the previous webinars are up on Catholic Faith Formation uh, Ireland uh, on, on YouTube, um, and I'll be posting details for the registration on religiouseducation.ie um, on the catechetics uh, website. So just to wish you all a, a, a pleasant rest of your evening and Sloan Agus Banat. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you, sister. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. God bless. See you soon. God bless. Bye.